Okay, um, I'd like to start by dedicating this talk to Jim Wyrick, who was a luminary in the Ruby community and passed away suddenly yesterday. He was uh, 58, I think, and uh, uh, actually something kind of neat happened today. He actually made a commit to one of his repos uh, on GitHub yesterday afternoon, I, I guess, at some point yesterday, and it's become, you know, you can comment on commits, it's become a place where people are leaving remembrances for him, so it's, it's been kind of neat to watch this, this one last bit of contributing to the community and how people have uh, uh, talked about it. Anyway, Jim Wyrick was, uh, was a really great guy. Uh, so, copious data. I'm, it's sort of a playful title uh, because not all data is big. Big data is kind of a marketing term that's overused. And what I'm going to talk about really applies not just for you know, real big data like Twitter or Facebook kind of data, but for a lot of the stuff we're doing today. Uh, we're kind of entering or have entered this realm of really data-centric applications. And I think it's actually transforming the way we write software. And this is uh, really the theme of the talk. Um, as Mike mentioned, I, I'm a consultant at TypeSafe. TypeSafe is the company that's sort of behind Scala, but mostly they sell uh, support and for open source tools for um, a web framework named Play and uh, a middleware layer called Akka that's uh, gained a lot of traction. And you can actually use these from Java as well as Scala. But uh, I work with clients to help them do that and also work on big data projects as, as the need arises. Um, I also founded a local Scala user group, and like Mike said, I helped organize this one. And uh, these are the books I've written. I'm actually, I'm actually working on a second edition of the Scala book because um, that, that it's four years old now. It needs to be refreshed. Uh, one other shameless plug, and then I'll get on to the real topic. There is a, a new conference in, that's been in Chicago. This is will be the second year. It's called GoTo. Uh, this is a series of conferences around the world that are very highly regarded, and that's the way I got involved in it. Um, it'll be in May, I believe, and I'd really like to encourage you to think about trying to go to this conference or get you know, your boss or whatever to send you. It's, it's a general programming conference, not specific to any one topic, but it's, um, I think it's a real gem for us to have this in town, so I hope you'll consider going. Okay, well, so what's copious data? Well, there's a couple of definitions. Uh, it's anything that's big enough to crash Excel, <laughs> uh, which is basically what the second one says, too. Anything that doesn't fit in RAM is, must be big. Um, maybe a more accurate definition is, uh, well, I'll let you do the math on the right to make sure it's correct. But, uh, you know, basically we've entered this era of data that's either too big or not doesn't quite fit the relational model or for one reason or another our traditional solutions aren't working so we're looking for new options whether it's size or type of data or the variability of the data whatever and all this is kind of being driven by three trends uh, the first is obvious the data sizes are growing we're keeping more data we're gathering more data we're not throwing as much away as we used to uh, I worked with a client a couple of years ago that uh, was throwing away data after three months because they couldn't keep it in their data warehouse anymore. Uh, and they did not want to do that for pretty good reasons. And so we uh, built a deep cluster for them so they could keep a couple of years worth of data at much lower cost. So this is an obvious one. Maybe what's less obvious is that we're seeing sort of a de-emphasis on formal modeling of our data, you know, developing schemas. And there's, this is a trend that's actually been happening in general in software where, you know, we used to do these big models of our code before we wrote it. Um, and that didn't work for a lot of reasons. And one of them is just simply the fact that it changes so fast anymore. We don't know from one year to the next what the de real data scheme is going to look like. So we need to be more flexible. And the other thing that's going on is we're integrating lots of different data sources that uh, may not be relational at all. Some of it might be raw text that we're going to mine for sentiment. Some of it might be semi-structured, like log data, where you know you might have a few structured bits, like the timestamp, the server, the warning, you know, whatever that kind of stuff. And then you'll get this string of text at the end that's you know my hair's on fire kind of stuff. And that's kind of the kind of thing where you need a mixture of tools to analyze. And one of my favorite trends is the fact that we're de and this sort of goes with the previous one actually, we're de-emphasizing the idea that we need to build a model of the world in our code and instead focusing more on fundamental algorithms and letting data drive the behavior through those algorithms. 
And a great example is this uh, car. This is the second generation Stanley, which is Google's self-driving car. Uh, You're um, not allowed to talk about it. You can say what? It here. You're not allowed to talk about it. Oh, that's it. right. That's, I can't talk about Google here. This is a, an anonymous self-driving car that somebody <laughs> built. Um, uh, yeah, it's, they, they've driven this thing a couple hundred thousand miles around the western United States, and the story I've heard is that, what? Ours is better. Uh, theirs is better. No gives us a better car, here.com. You heard it here first, I guess. Um, anyway, the only wreck they've ever had with these things is when a grad student was driving and he tail end and he rear ended somebody. But, um, and actually, the Sebastian threw in the Stanford professor who's been behind this project. is actually very passionate about the idea that we should not be driving cars, that we should let machines do it because they're safer. And he's probably right. We've gotten to the point where we can do this. Uh, and another really interesting example of this is a sort of public fight that broke out between somebody you probably recognize at the top, Noam Chomsky, the famous linguist, and Peter Norvig, the director of research at Google, who's an artificial intelligence expert. And it was really a, a fundamental argument about the nature of the world, really, because Chomsky is famous for building these sort of formal models of grammar and speech and so forth in language. Whereas what's actually working, it turns out, and what Norvig is a big proponent of, is probabilistic models that don't actually understand speech in the way we think of understanding but they use probabilistic uh, training to figure out. You know, you throw data at it, you train the system, and it has no idea what it's doing, but suddenly it can actually uh, translate speech, recognize what you're saying, that sort of thing. People have been doing this for like 50 years now. Well, it's, they have been doing it for a while. It's, it's sort of reached critical mass in the last decade as far as capabilities, and, and part of it is that just the uh, yeah, ability the to is uh, data, which is uh, fairly savvy. Right, so yeah, there's a guy named Jeffrey Hinton who was a pioneer in neural networks. When those went out of fashion, he was about the only guy still doing them, and now they've come back into fashion. So yeah, that's, there's not a lot new here per se, although there has been a lot of developments in the last decade to make it more viable. But nevertheless, you know, this fundamental argument of should we model the world or should we let fundamental algorithms be driven by data? Okay, let me talk. Um, Again, sort of back to this whole big data world, let me just walk you through an example of what MapReduce is all about for those of you that are new to it. Um, the dominant platform that people use for big data problems is this thing called Hadoop, which probably you've heard of. And the compute model that uh, does your actual work on top of that is something called MapReduce. And what you typically do is you write code, you turn it into a job, and we'll actually look at some code shortly. And then you submit it to this job tracker thing that on the left in, in the master node. It figures out how to break up your job into tasks that it can distribute over a cluster. So you get economies of scale and performance by you know, uh, radical distribution of, of computation. The other piece of Hadoop is a distributed file system, a virtualized file system, where it looks like you have one file system, but even though it's uh, you know, terabytes in size, it's you know, actually spread out over uh, a cluster of nodes, and then the, the name node, data node stuff is responsible for the file system. So those are the two fundamental pieces of Hadoop, this compute model, MapReduce, which is really what we're going to focus on, and then the storage underneath this distributed file system. What I want to do, so that you'll be able to go to cocktail parties and tell people what MapReduce actually means, is just show you uh, very quickly and briefly how uh, you can do one algorithm in MapReduce, which is the so-called inverted index. So when you type uh, the word Hadoop into the Google search box, Google has already figured out that that word is frequently occurring on a certain group of pages in the world, and then it will take you right to it you know, in less than a second. They, they love to tell you that they found you know, hundreds of, um, or thousands of, of pages you know, in less than a second. Of course, they didn't go out and walk the interwebs at that, that moment. They've actually done this in advance. So there's this first step where we're going to crawl the interwebs. This is not to do at all. It's just web crawler robots. Um, if you've ever looked at server logs for web servers, you see lots of entries where somebody's you know, walked to your site. Uh, the example I have here, which I know is a little small to read, but the gist of it is what really matters. And, and by the way, there's a link on the uh, front. You'll see it at the end where you can grab these slides and we'll post them as well. But anyway, 
So suppose that my web crawler finds Wikipedia, not hard to find, and then it finds a couple of pages on Wikipedia, like the page for Hadoop, the page for what we got here, HBase, and Pi. And what it's going to do is build up this index that'll just have like the, the URL or maybe an index, like an integer or something, or you know, space, and then it will have the contents of that page. And that's all it's going to have right now. So it'll build up that, that index. And I have the words block on here because typically these are written into big continuous files on hard drives. And, the, and in the Hadoop world, those are typically 64 megs, 128 megs, something like that. The reason that matters is because when we get to actually processing this data with MapReduce, each of those blocks is going to get its own JVM process, a task, and it's going to work on that chunk of data in the initial step of a MapReduce job, which is the map step. So a MapReduce job consists of a map step and a reduce step. <coughs> Sometimes you have to sequence these together to get you know, more non-trivial work done. So the gist of, of it is, is this. So this map task, say the first one, is going to start reading the contents of each of these rows and its block. And what it's going to do is tokenize that text that's on the page, and then it's going to spit out new key value pairs, where the key will be the word, each word that it finds, and the value then will be another sort of nested tuple of the, the page, and then maybe the count on that page. Because not only do you want to find the word in all the pages where the word Hadoop occurs, you kind of like to find where it occurs most frequently because presumably those are the most interesting pages that talk about Hadoop. So it's, each map task will be spitting out these key value pairs. And the trick is we want to find all the occurrences of the word Hadoop and all the HDFS, the Hadoop distributed file system, and so forth. So each of these mappers might find some occurrences of each of those, and we want to bring them all together. And that's what the middle step does. The sort shuffle is done automatically, whereas I had to write the code that did that tokenizing and outputting the key value pairs in the mapper. And uh, you know, through a magic process we don't need to get into, it's going to make sure that all of the occurrences of Hadoop show up at the same reducer. All the occurrences of HDFS show up at the same reducer. And the way I made up this example is I'll say that the first reduce task is going to get all of the words that start with H. So it'll see all the Hadoops, all the HBases, all the HDFSs, all the Hives, etc. I had AND showing up at the bottom one just arbitrarily. And then reduce task then is going to get all of these occurrences of Hadoop together and then spit out a final record where it has just one keyword, you know, Hadoop, and then a list of all of the documents that had that word. Usually sorted by frequency. So the, the Wikipedia page for Hadoop is probably going to be very close to the beginning of the list. You know, some, some obscure web page that only mentions to do in the past will be at the end of the list and so forth. So that when you then ask Google, tell me about Hadoop, it's going to have this last data set in some sort of uh, fast lookup database somewhere, and then it'll be able to give you those answers very quickly. So that's really the gist of uh, the inverted index. So the essence of a MapReduce job is it really is just this two-step. Uh, the first thing is called a map. That's actually a lie because maps are one-to-one -one processes in mathematics. It's actually something called flat map where you have zero to many outputs. So really all this stuff we've been talking about and making money on, some of us maybe, or not so much, should really be called flat map reduce. But we have the word map reduce. And then so we did that initial processing in the maps. And then we're going to do this uh, sort shuffle in the middle automatically. And then finally we'll just reduce everything to our final output. And this is a quiz. If this is funny, then you figured you got what I was just talking about. All right. So, flat map and reduce are our friends. And this is really, you know, as of today, the most common way of uh, doing big data or even not so big data to do clusters is writing these jobs one way or the other and then using the data, uh, the distributed uh, data file system underneath. However, um, you know, it's not perfect. There's a lot of issues. So let's start talking about some of those. This is my gratuitous romantic beach scene. This is Ohio Street Beach. Uh, not this year, but a couple winters ago. Well, one of the problems is, um, you know, you, as you would expect, no tool is going to meet every need. There's always going to be drawbacks, and that's certainly the case here. 
Well, we'll not worry about HDFS right now. We'll just focus on MapReduce. The first problem is it's actually damn hard to implement non-trivial algorithms in MapReduce. Uh, my favorite example is uh, you, you've probably all written a SQL statement like you know select star from table, you know order by x descending, order by y ascending. You know, very simple, straightforward thing to write. It is hard as hell to write that in MapReduce. You can actually do it, uh, but it's it's actually an exercise in torture. Um, if you really want to know the details, uh, read Hadoop, the Definitive Guide by Tom White, and he'll walk you through the gory details. So we'd really like to get rid of that low-level assembly language programming, which is what you typically do when you're writing MapReduce jobs. So that's one problem, is that algorithms are hard to implement. It's also really coarse-grained. It actually kind of sucks that we just have this one big chunky map step and this one big chunky reduce step. Uh, because not everything fits into that model very well, and we often have to sequence multiple MapReduce jobs together. But the problem is, this, I don't know about the Google implementation of MapReduce, they actually invented the model, but uh, at least the Hadoop version is that between each of those MapReduce jobs, it's going to flush all of your data back to disk, and then read it all, all the way back in. What? A little bit more with that. Yeah, there's, they're, they're working on improvements to the model that will get rid of this. Because it turns out if you get rid of this, if you can actually cache the data in the middle, which some tools are doing already, you can easily speed up performance by orders of magnitude. So it's actually a huge penalty to do this. And this whole system was really designed initially for offline batch mode analytics. You know, I ingested all of the clickstream data from yesterday, now I want to run analytics on it. Which is still a thing that we like to do, the problem is that sometimes we really would like to react to events as they're happening at large scale. So, you know, if you're Twitter, you want to see what hashtags are trending, you want to you know, react to them uh, as quickly as possible. There's just a whole lot of scenarios where waiting is just not a good thing. So event stream processing is another problem. And then it turns out that the Hadoop Java API itself is actually a total pain in the ass to use. So let's actually look at that just to make the point. And we'll do a simpler version of an algorithm. This is word count. We're, we're just going to forget where we saw all of these words. We're not going to index them. We're just going to find the words and count them. That's all we want to do. It's the simplest algorithm that you can do in Hadoop. It's sort of the, the hello world of Hadoop because everybody does this one the first time out. So we'll tokenize each of these documents, you know, web pages, and then we'll uh, just uh, aggregate the counts of all the words. And if you do that in the Java API, it's too small to read. Um, deliberately so. And this actually isn't the whole program. I left out the main routine, which you know sacrifices the chickens and whatever else you have to do to make the dupe happy. But there's just a lot of ceremony in this stuff. And one of the things I'd like you to notice as we look at these code examples, we're going to walk through a few, is just the colors. The colors that are green, the, the words that are green are all types. And Java is very wordy about types, and that can be a good thing because it gives you a little extra safety. But on the other hand, it tends to just get in your way a lot. We'd like to, you know, cut that noise down as best we can while still getting some of the benefits. And what we would actually like to see a lot more of is yellow. Those are all the method calls, and those are the things that are actually doing real work, like converting my strings to lowercase, like splitting on white space, like um, counting things, and so forth. So we'd like to see a lot less green and a lot more yellow. Uh, the orange is keywords. We don't really care much about those. So in fact, in this example, the interesting bits are right here. The first bubble is actually doing that splitting of strings into words and then outputting those key value pairs we talked about. And the second bubble is doing that final reduction where all of the occurrences of Hadoop show up together and we just count. So it would be great if we could write this, this algorithm, which is not a complicated algorithm, but be able to write it in just this amount of code that's circled, and we're actually going to get there. So when I first saw this, uh, algorithm, uh, this uh, API and examples like this one, my first thought was that the 90s called and they wanted their enterprise job beans back. So some of you who worked in, uh, with EJBs will know what I'm talking about. It was a very invasive API. It was in your face. It was hard to actually find the logic, the business logic in your code because it was all this ceremony to, to make the uh, infrastructure happy. This is not the way we should be building software. The Spring Framework taught us how to write enterprise Java. We need to find a better way to write enterprise to do, I guess, our, our data. 
So, and in fact, we do have some good options. So let's look at some. This is actually the uh, Fermilab building, if you've uh, never been out there, but maybe uh, Well, first, there's a really nice higher level API that raises the abstraction level in Java called cascading. The idea in cascading is that you're basically going to take these pipes of operations and sort of glue them together to form a data flow. And they also use the term taps for the sources of data and the sync. So, well, let's look at a picture of it, actually. So what we're going to do, this is work count again. I'm going to read some data off HDFS. And notice I've got these little pipes that are kind of glued together that I've got data streaming between them. They're actually stateless. That's one of the important things. They're not actually remembering what they're doing. They're just taking each line and splitting it into white space or whatever. I didn't have a regular expression shown here. And then those words are going to go into group by. So that's a phrase you ought to be familiar with. If you've ever written SQL statements, how many times have you done a group by clause? It's exactly the same concept. This is our first clue, actually, that we're going to make a, a correspondence between programming and SQL. And I sort of implied that SQL isn't programming. That's not exactly what I meant. But I think you'll see what I'm getting at. And then finally, we'll count each of those groups of words. And, then, and again, these, are, these little modules that we're gluing together are stateless. They're not keeping track of state. I'm hitting all the wrong buttons here. Let's see if I get back. There we go. Um, this turns out to be an extremely powerful concept if we can glue together these little pipes of operations together. It turns out that there's no better tool for reuse than we have in software development. That's, that's one of my themes I want to get across today, is that this is how we should build software, not only for data, but in general, this is actually really useful. Well, here's what the cascading code looks like. It doesn't really look, at first glance, like it's much of an improvement. There's still a lot of green. There's um, a lot of lines of code. But it turns out there are some uh, real improvements here. It, it's still wordy because it's Java, and Java's wordy. But this is actually the whole program, except for some import statements that I got rid of as opposed to the previous one that wasn't the full program. And actually, it turns out, if you look carefully at some of the green things towards the bottom, and I'll let you do this on your own time, because you probably can't read it, uh, most of you. But you'll see words in green, like group by each, which is like a for each kind of statement. And those are actually the kind of operations that would be functions, would be the yellow methods in other languages. But because Java doesn't have anonymous functions, at least it won't for another month, Java 8 is going to fix this. Uh, we have to do objects for a lot of things we wouldn't actually write an object for in other languages. So actually, this code reads a lot more like the problem domain, it turns out. Once you understand the API, there's actually less ceremony here for setting up the infrastructure and more about, I need to count words. But we can still do dramatically better than this. Um, there's an API that Twitter wrote on top of Cascading called Scalding. And the, the story behind it was um, some guys at Twitter were using another language called Pig that some of you may have heard of. And, and one of the guys that worked for them named Avi Bryant did not like Pig. They were already using Scala for infrastructure. So he thought, you know, why don't I just write a, an API around Cascading that's a little bit more concise than Cascading. And that's how Scalding got started. Uh, his name is Avi Bryant. He's done some really interesting talks about math and big data problems, if you want to Google his name. Anyway, this is the entire program in Scalding. Notice the font's a lot bigger. It's, we're now down to about as many lines of code as I said we wanted to get to. Notice the colors, too. There's very little green here. And that's uh, one of the reasons is because Scala will infer types in, in most contexts. So we just create a class that does our word counting. We pass in some arguments, the, like the usual command line arguments. And if you just you know, read the yellow, even if you don't know Scala, even if you don't know Java, you can probably figure out what's going on pretty quickly just by reading the yellow. I'm reading something. I'm doing this flat map operation. We already said that's what our map is really doing. We're passing a function to that flat map that says, all right, take each line and convert it to lowercase, trim off white space, split it on uh, white, there's a regular expression there, but basically I'm splitting on white space. If we know SQL, we already know what group by does. We must be grouping over the words to get a group of uh, you know, like all of the occurrences of Hadoop, all the occurrences of HDFS, and then we're going to count the size of that group. Um, 
that there's some details here that you would have to learn to understand what this API is doing, like all of these uh, words that have the funny tick mark at the beginning are, are actually the names of fields, things like that. But, you know, actually, I, I think I could take a, like a SAS programmer or somebody that has a little bit of programming ability and teach them how to use this API, where I'd never try to do that with Java. It would just be too much. But here we're just writing scripts. Uh, we're not writing programs so much as writing scripts because it's so concise. The, the infrastructure has just receded so much into the background and we're back to just writing solutions to problems. And that's why this, this API is really catching on in a big way for this reason because it's, to me, the, the perfect solution for this problem. It's about as good as you're going to get. Well, I'm obviously a scholar bigot, as you might imagine already, but just to be clear that this is a general property of functional languages. Let's look at the same example in Clojure in an API called Cascalog, which is also sitting on top of Cascading. And it's even smaller. Uh, this is using data log style queries, if any of you remember that from computer science. I don't really understand what this code's doing myself. Uh, in part because I don't know closure that well, but nevertheless, the point being that once you understand an API and once you have the right language and, and abstractions, you can do an amazing amount of work in, in an amazingly small amount of code. And there's some other APIs that I won't go into, but just for completeness, here's some other options that kind of do the same. Well, as of today, cascading still is running on top of. I'm sorry, uh, Scalding is running on top of Cascading, which is running on top of MapReduce. So you still have some issues with it's more batch mode than real time. It's got the overhead we described for Hadoop. It turns out uh, Cloudera has recently embraced an alternative a compute engine called Spark. It's also written in Scala. But Spark largely eliminates a lot of the problems with MapReduce because it does things like cache data and memory between these you know, steps. It has more fine-grained operators that we can pose together. Uh, in general, it's, it's a much more effective tool for most of us. And actually, Spark also supports an event stream processing mode as well, which is going to be really handy. And here's that same program in Spark. You know, the details are a little different, but the gist of it is basically the same. Not so much ceremony in the type system, more about the functions that are doing operations on data. Um, so I mentioned they, they do some smart caching of data, and because of that, they easily get 30x to more improvement over MapReduce. It's, it's sort of like shooting fish in a barrel, really. It was actually originally written for uh, machine learning. Yeah? Spark is effective in MapReduce. They, they cache the data fast, but MapReduce is still the same on Well, not so much. There's, there's, there's more fine-grained operations in Spark. You don't have to have like once uh, one map, one reduced step. It's, it's a more composable model, um, uh, and they have less overhead in, in spinning these things up too. So this was actually developed at Berkeley, but it's now an Apache project. And as I mentioned, Cloudera has actually announced official support for it. So if you're a Cloudera customer, you can actually use it and have somebody to sue if it goes wrong. So it's okay, but. You know, this is all great for programmers, right? And this has so far been just kind of programmer-centric. But maybe you're a data person. You're kind of used to working in SQL. Well, there's actually a bunch of SQL options. Um, the first one was Hive, because Facebook had this problem that they were gathering all this data into MapReduce, or rather, Hadoop clusters. Uh, they have something like 700 petabytes now in Hadoop clusters. And they had all these data analysts that wanted to write SQL queries so they could ask questions about this data. Which is, you know, about as, there's nothing more concise than a SQL for asking those kind of questions. And then, in my opinion, if, if Hive did not exist, Hadoop would not be nearly as popular because typically the organizations I would go into when I was doing Hadoop consulting, there'd be a few overworked guys that were running the clusters, you know, that were, they, the, they sort of wanted to have beards, they couldn't have time to shave. There'd be a small team of developers doing like extract, transform, and load, and those kind of uh, things. And then there'd be you know, just rooms full of data analysts that were used to writing SAS and SQL queries and stuff like that. And so these people are actually able to be productive at Hadoop because of these tools like Hive. Uh, briefly, just to describe what these different variants are. So Hive is sort of the pioneer. It's not very ANSI standard. 
So there are some ANSI standard alternatives emerging, like Langwall, which sits on top of Cascade. Uh, they've imported Hive to Spark so that you get the benefits of Spark's performance over MapReduce. That's called Shark. Clever name, right? Okay. And then there's some next generation compute engines that are oriented towards queries that are much, much faster, like Impala and Presto, which is a big Facebook open source thing and so forth. So it's kind of amazing that Hive just sort of started out as a hack to let you do SQL kind of semantics on top of MapReduce files or uh, HDFS files. And it sort of took on a life of its own because it was so useful. And it turns out you can actually write word count in high. And this actually uh, is about as concise as the previous example, but it even creates a table and loads data into it. So that's the first three lines. So I'm going to create a table that'll just be my documents where I'll have, you know, one each line will be, you know, a document, quote unquote. A very simple schema. And then uh, it's actually just flat files on, on my HDFS system, but it looks like it's a table. And then I can write queries where I'm actually cheating a little bit and using some of the features of Pi, like the ability to nest arrays and maps. And what's the other one? If you're going to nest these, these data structures inside, you can denormalize your data into records, whereas you know, if you're using Oracle, the only option would be like a blob or something. So it, we see explode and split. There's sort of some magic there where I'm creating a nested array of these uh, records and then doing grouping and so forth over them. But nevertheless, if you know SQL, you can learn this in a day and then you're just off and running with, uh, with Hive and you're running crazy stuff like this, which is not a typical SQL kind of query. Remember what I said earlier? There were three trends and I said the second one was we're de-emphasizing schema. Well, maybe. Because actually, uh, SQL is just roaring back in a lot of ways. Because people realize it's just too useful to be able to write a SQL query. There are too many people that know how to do it, too many people that want to do it. And so in my opinion, I would be really hesitant to use a database that didn't give me a SQL abstraction anymore. Even Cassandra now has its own SQL called CQL, for Cassandra query language. It's just too damn useful. Um, when I gave this talk last night, I mentioned that uh, I was sort of a typical software developer before I got into the big data world. You know, I kind of like poo pooed the DBAs, you know, they were annoying, you know. I just wanted to get the data out of the database into memory and then do what I wanted with it. But I kind of really learned to appreciate SQL when I got into this business because it's, it's so incredibly useful and so, it's so concise for getting your work done. So I'm now more likely to start by writing SQL queries when I'm working with data and only go to Scalding or one of these other alternatives when I need to do something crazy that doesn't work so well with the SQL, like a machine learning algorithm. Okay, so let's uh, let's try to bring this back together then. So I sort of talked about SQL here a little bit. I talked about programming with you know, functions. What does all this really mean? I guess there's some sort of a unity to it because, you know, the, it wasn't really an accident that the Scala and Clojure code was nice and concise and gave us the, the abstractions we wanted to express our algorithm. And just like SQL does when we're expressing queries. And it's because really all of these things boil down to mathematics. When we're working with data at the end of the day, no matter what we do with it, it really we're just doing math. We're doing sums, we're doing averages, you know, we're doing predictive models on top of it. Well, it just boils down to mathematics at the end of the day. So languages and environments that promote that notion of working with data with mathematical abstractions are going to be the big win for us. And I just want to walk through uh, briefly a few areas of math that are, are really having an impact in computing, uh, in language design, and so forth. And I'll start with the most esoteric one, which is category theory. So in the functional programming world, and it's especially evident in the Scala community, there's sort of a bifurcation between the people that really want to push the envelope on mathematical stuff. And in particular, they want to bring in what's been pioneered in a language called Haskell, versus those who are maybe a little more pragmatic and you know, come from an object-oriented background and don't want to get too crazy with the math. The category three stuff sort of is on that extreme end, although it does have a lot of useful things to teach us, and that's why I bring it up. One way to think about this stuff is I'm going to describe functional design patterns, which hopefully you've heard of before. Well, sometimes when we're working with these you know, basic data structures, we're either working with sets or lists or maps or things like that. 
hopefully remember from computer science. Monads are a way of abstracting over this, the commonality of that structure. Like I need to sequence operations. I need to have some collection of stuff and then do operations over it in a uniform way without having to know whether I'm working with a map or a set or a list and so forth. It turns out that we can generalize our basic notions of arithmetic, like addition, multiplication, and so forth. And, the, and these terms up here, are group theory, monoids, groups, and rings, are just the mathematical abstractions of these very simple ideas. So when you see something like this, you know, a plus b plus c plus d, the thing is, it doesn't actually matter whether those are numbers or matrices or their count min sketches, or a lot of other algorithms and data structures that we're used to using. Keep hitting this thing. Got way off here, sorry about this. If we have a basic notion of abstracting over addition, it's amazing what we can actually do with that, with code that just knows about addition. Uh, and this is a really eye-opening talk right here by Avi Bryant, the guy that I mentioned earlier. If you Google this, add all the things, you'll find this video from last year's Strangelet conference. And it's actually very easy to understand, even though I've used some fancy words like monoid, it's actually a very simple concept. But it's another design pattern that we can exploit in our code. Linear algebra is something that's really important in machine learning. And one of my favorite examples of this is the so-called eigenfaces example. So it turns out, suppose I have, say, a thousand faces, you know, images of faces. And I put these into a matrix where I just take the pixels for each face and turn it into this long vector. And then I ask for the major modes of these faces. And these are the, four, the top four that pop out of an example I had in a course that I took several years ago. And all of you, because we're so good at recognizing faces, all of you can tell that these are basically faces in some sense. I mean, you can see eyes, you can see noses, and chins, and so forth. The idea here is that if I find, say, the, the top 100 modes in, in this collection of faces, then I can just take those 100 vectors and reproduce all 1,000 faces with enough accuracy that you can recognize them. So it's actually a dimensional reduction technique where it might be computationally too hard to work with 1,000 people for a thousand vectors, but it's a lot easier if I only need a hundred to represent the data to a good approximation. We do like looking at these things because they're so eerie looking, but nevertheless, this is just matrix math. Again, the algorithms that are running this kind of stuff have no idea they're trying to recognize spaces, but um, they're just using some basic fundamentals of linear algebra. Now, getting closer to maybe something you know already, it turns out the relational model that's the, at the basis of all our databases is really based on set theory and first order logic. So this is a screenshot from Cod's original paper about it. I love the word shared databanks. It sounds so cool. But anyway. Now, of course, actually relational databases don't quite follow the model exactly. For example, the model implied, or wanted all of each, uh, each record to be unique, whereas we kind of allow duplicate records in databases, just as an example. But nevertheless, getting back to uh, the word combinators again, which I started this section with, remember that bubble diagram I showed earlier of what cascading does, how you glue these little pipes together? This is basically what, this is a fancy word for what those things are. This is a math term, and all it really means is these are functions that don't have side effects. What that means is that they don't modify the world around them. Uh, think about all the math functions you ever used in high school math, like cosine and sine. I know some of you are saying, oh my god, I'm just memory is But, you know, no matter how hard it is to calculate cosine or sine of something, it doesn't actually, like, modify some object or some global state. It does a lot of crunching on whatever input you gave it, and then it spits out a result. And then it forgets what it did. And that's the idea here. We're not going to modify the state of the world, we're just going to pass data in, it will do some transformation, and then pass data out. And when we do that, we can actually glue these things together in all kinds of different ways to compose the more complex behaviors we want. These things have all kinds of software development advantages. They're incredibly easy to test, they're incredibly easy to reuse, they're incredibly easy to replace with faster implementations, or with a lookup table, if you happen to know you only ever call cosine for you know, zero degrees and 90 degrees or something. 
They're extremely powerful in all the levels we care about for software development. So to kind of bring this to a head, this sort of unification between programs and SQL, let's look at a few of these combinators as you're used to seeing them in SQL. And we'll start with just a table definition. So this is just a classic, rather trivial definition of a table in ANSI SQL with, you know, this would be like the output of word counts. Each word is going to be up to 64 characters. That's obviously arbitrary. Excuse me. And then an integer that's the count of the occurrences of that word. And here's how we might declare it in Scala. I mean, this isn't really that important, but I might say I've got a stream of data coming in that's going to be a tuple of a string and an integer. That's all I'm really saying with this declaration here. What's more interesting, though, is that we can do a lot of the same things with Scala's built-in collection API that we can do with SQL. You know, we can do where clauses, or the equivalent there, which is called restrict in uh, the relational model, where, you know, where uh, word equals Chicago in Scala, and, and I'm using Scala because I know it best. Actually, Java 8 will give you exactly the same thing. You don't have to do you will in Java 8. Closure, Ruby, Python, all of these things would do the same thing. But I basically have a collection of word counts, so I'm going to filter them where I'll pass, I'll use a function that takes you know, the word in the count, you know, each record as it is, as, as it is and then ask, is this is the word equal Chicago? And it will return, it, well, it's kind of a trivial example because I'm only going to return one record, obviously, since there's only one occurrence in Chicago, but you get the point. Maybe I don't care about the counts, I just want to project out the words. Select word from word counts. Similarly, down here, I could do a map. And this is a real map operation. It's one to one. It's not zero to many, like flat map. I'm just going to throw away the count and return the word. So I have the stream of data coming in with two things. I'm going to strip out one of them and just have a, a stream of words. Now, joins are a little bit more complex. Usually, joins require a lot of infrastructure to be efficient because they tend to be very inefficient. So I, uh, the Scala collections don't provide a join, but uh, we'll just look at a Scala example quickly. And to have something to join against, I'll just mix in a, di a dictionary table that has a definition of, of my words. So in SQL, it's pretty simple. I can just project out the word and the definition you know, from this join clause. In Scalding, you would do something like this. It's not quite as elegant, but it does work pretty well once you get the syntax. I'm going to define two input streams. The CSV means I'm, I'm saying that I know this data is just flat files, comma-separated values. And again, the, the, the tick marks indicate that I'm just going to call the first field a word, the second field a count, and so forth. And then there's this clause where I happen to know that the, uh, the dictionary is the larger of the two because I'll have a subset of words in the dictionary, so I'm going to treat my word counts as the smaller data set, my dictionary as the larger data set, and then join them on the word, or sorry, the two word objects. Uh, there's, there's some idiosyncrasies about scalding syntax that aren't really worth getting into, but I think you get the gist of it. So putting it together, it's sort of about the same amount of code but it is kind of cleaner in SQL, to be fair. All right, and obviously a real system would have to uh, do some optimizations to do this efficiently for large data sets. Uh, and I think the last one I have is just group by. We brought that up before. So here I might be on the SQL query at the top. What that's going to print out is, what I want to know is, um, how many times does a word occur three times? How many words do I get an occurrence of 20? And then I want to sort by the most frequently to less frequently occurring. So that's all this query is doing. And the SQL code is fairly straightforward. The Scala code, and back to regular Scala, is not quite as concise. But the thing is, once you understand all of these little yellow operators and know how what kind of functions you have to pass to them, which is the stuff in curly braces, these are just anonymous functions. Then you can just bang out these non-trivial algorithms fairly quickly with just a, a relatively small amount of code, composing things together to get the behavior you want. And that's what I'm doing here. Uh, something else I was going to mention about this. Uh, what is it? I guess that's probably it. But anyway, so you obviously have to learn these little combinators. But once you get them down, then it's really easy to compose behaviors like you want. 
If the advantage of so why would you use Scala though if I could use SQL? Well, my answer is always use SQL if you can, but if you need Turing completeness, go to a programming language like Scala. Unfortunately, Pig is not Turing complete, so I think it's one of the reasons that Pig is probably going to die out eventually. And here I actually wrote a full example. You can actually start Scala in an interpret mode where you just type code in. And if you actually did that and just put in this example, I color coded it by hand, but if you put this in, you would get the output at the bottom. Okay, well we can keep going, but I think you hopefully get the sense of what, what I'm talking about here is that there's really a natural synergy between SQL and all of the convenient operators we're used to, to using for concisely expressing queries and similar operators that are a part of functional languages on the collection APIs they provide. And I think, uh, you know, you, you use SQL when you need highly optimized queries for uh, your various data operations, but if you need Turing completeness or a wider variety of combinators, and if you need to be able to pass functions that you know, control the behavior of these operators, then a language like Scala or any of the other sort of modern languages that do the trick. So I really think that FP functional programming is actually the future of software development, not just for copious data, but in general. This is a, right outside my condo window over the River North. Every now and then on Sunday morning, a, a heavy lift helicopter shows up to pick up, uh, actually they're like uh, you know, air conditioning units. They pick them up off the ground and drop them on the top of buildings. That building in the left corner with the glass windows, that's a hotel. And there have been a couple of times when I've seen these helicopters fly down next to that window, and I just wonder what the people think that are you know, staying in this nice hotel and have this helicopter outside their window at 9 in the morning on Sunday. But there's a popular claim that the reason uh, functional programming uh, suddenly became interesting to everybody about five, you know, eight years ago was because we kind of hit the wall with Moore's Law, and we realized that the only way to keep scaling was to scale horizontally. Well, I think we're actually we're figuring out ways to get around that problem without it embracing functional programming. And in fact, I believe that solving data problems is going to really drive uh, the adoption of functional paradigms like this. Because it's just such a natural thing to do when you're trying to manipulate data and you're working in a programming language like you know, Java, Scala, whatever. It's just so much more natural to have the tools at your disposal to manipulate the data that you don't get in a typical object. Okay, um, to sort of wrap this up, let's talk about how this is changing data architectures, sort of things that uh, the guys who don't code anymore build, I guess. But it used to be we all built stuff like this, where you know maybe the user does something in, in, in a browser and that triggers a query to the database and then we take the results set and pass it through an object relational mapper. And that goes into our model of the world object model, and then we do some other stuff and send it through our system and ultimately back to the user or maybe to a database. The problem is this is incredibly inefficient. The overhead of these steps is just ridiculous for something like you know, a true big data problem. We really can't afford this overhead. And furthermore, we run into this problem I mentioned earlier where if we've got this very nice model of the world in code, it's going to be changing all the time. So we want to be more agnostic in these modules. And that's pushing us in this direction, which is really what's what we're doing with Hadoop already, where we're just treating these, um, this, these data sets as fundamental entities and just working with them. Uh, if you were writing you know, Java or whatever code, what you might do is take that result set that comes out of JDBC and wrap it in a collection that gives you the combinators I described. But the less transformation you can do, the less domain knowledge you bring into your code, the more flexible it is, the less it has to be modified to uh, meet new requirements, and the faster it's going to perform. <coughs> so when you look at typical functional code, whether it's Scala or Clojure or Haskell or whatever, it typically has a lot more use of these fundamental data types like lists, maps, sets, trees, etc., and a lot less of ad hoc invention of objects, because you just don't need them as much if you're not encoding everything in the world in your domain. Because when we did that, we ended up with these big wads of code that were not only bulky and slow, but hard to tease apart into separate services. 
I think actually the biggest mistake object-oriented programming made, or at least the way we adopted it, is we, we sort of bought into this idea that it's actually a good idea to, to embed our domain knowledge into our code. It sounds good, and there are some advantages to it, like you know, a common language that you and your stakeholders are discussing. The problem is you start embedding stuff that doesn't really need to be there, and it just becomes weight that you end up carrying around, and it becomes a burden. But if we have these relatively lightweight agnostic services, then it's much easier to clone them and have you know, duplicate copies running. Yes? I'm, I'm kind of slow. If you could go to the previous one. Go to the no, previous slow one. And that? No, one more. One more? There you go. So how is this simple? At the end of the day, you have list maps as a reusable object. Right. The object still exists. Right. Well, in Java, the, in the JVM, these are all options. The thing is, though, that you're not embedding. Yeah, yeah. Those are collections. Yeah. Collections of what? Well, they might be collections of primitives. You know, like if you're running payroll, maybe you don't need to know that this particular flow is the, you know, insurance deduction, for example. So you do. But, well, you 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 know it in the sense of you wrote the code, so you know what you know. I'm going to take the third column and send it through this con this calculation, but you don't have to necessarily call that third column. Uh, an object name or a, a class named uh, what did I say insurance deduction? Uh, I feel two reasonably good Java developers. They will never make them an object. Writing Java, they will make the same collapse. Why? Well, so and keep in mind, we're talking about the performance concerns too here. Like, what would this data look like if it were in Parquet, for example? It would basically be you know one column of contiguous bytes for this float another column for this int and so forth. So why don't I just work with the ints and the floats and not have boxing, not have other overheads that I don't really need to express the logic of the code. Now, I'm not going to get into too much, but actually I think the sort of architectures we're really going to see, or at least maybe designs, is you'll have these fundamental collections that are, and you know stuff that's slung together that's fairly agnostic. But you'll write these domain-specific languages on top where you'll compose those fundamentals into this is my payroll calculator, but it's just translating into some you know, slinging lists of floats around and not worrying about naming them in any particular way or giving them the ceremony of wrapping them in objects. So I, I buy the sales idea. Of course, it will do. It will make your programming quite far simpler. Yeah. But keep in mind there is one thing. DSL will make it by far simpler. DSL will make it by far more complicated to optimize. Well, it depends. So I and I don't want to undermine or downplay the difficulty of writing good DSLs, so or domain specific languages if you haven't heard that term. They're actually harder to write than APIs. And they should not be part of like the control flow. They should be more like this is the wiring language, and then I'm just going to send this thing running at full speed. So there, there's definitely an art that I, you know, don't want to get into too much. But I think that's one way to sort of compromise with the advantages of having your domain knowledge in your code versus the disadvantages of embedding it when you don't need it. That's that's my argument. Well, the truth is always somewhere in the middle. Yeah, you always are trying to sweep. Yeah, and, and there's trade-offs either way. No question about it. All right, well, anyway, uh, it is generally easier, though, to do this sort of horizontal scaling with a model like this, where things, these processes that are, are now relatively agnostic. And that fits this model, too, if this is working. Of, um, we need to scale up on the size of the data, so we have to scale horizontally to meet that. Uh, if the processes themselves are agnostic or more agnostic about the structure of the data, then that helps that as well. And then, of course, hopefully we're deriving all this from real data. Okay, so to wrap up then, uh, I do think that uh, MapReduce was a model that got us going. It made a lot of people productive. It got a lot of problems solved, but it was deeply flawed from the beginning. Uh, like enterprise job of beans, and it's time for something better. And I think the we're already seeing what the, that something better is. It's either uh, languages and APIs that are more functionally oriented, like the Scalding example here, that are just very concise and very expressive, 
I said to do this to you, but map and reuse are functional. So in the yes. web, they are functional. Right, functions. right. And there's, I think there's, a, there's a, there, here's map right here, flat map, and group by is a reduce operation, right? So they haven't gone away. And they, and they are very much functional. That's where the names came from. But the way they were realized by Google is, is what I'm saying as a lot. Well, the name came from this. Yeah, yeah. But maybe you don't use this, maybe you just use C when you can. Okay. Good. Wrong thing again. Not very good with this, apparently. All right, questions? And here's the link, by the way, if you want to grab the slides before. I'll send the link around. Just send me the links on your slides and put it up on the website. Or yeah. you can do it. You're an organizer, you can do it yourself. I guess they could. It's lazy. Questions? Anybody else besides Boris think I'm full of shit? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you finally put it in. I was waiting for this. <laughs> Go ahead. I have a generalized question on just the selection of Hadith versus others. Um, I'm learning that the data architecture is key in determining when to use Hadoop and when to use something else. So you first determine what the end result looks like, select the architecture, and then determine if Hadoop is the best. Do you do you use that approach? Yeah, I think that's the way it should be done. There's certainly a lot of people doing the opposite. Uh, for the video, the question was, um, uh, shouldn't you figure out what it is you're trying to do first before deciding yeah. to use a do? Like, I think that's a good paraphrase. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right. Um, I mean, a lot of people are buying to do clusters or building them because, you know, it's sort of like you buy IBM and if you don't want to get fired or you don't want to get left behind. And, and I've seen people that don't really need to do for what they're doing. On the other hand, an advantage of it is because it's so general purpose and so flexible that it's usually true that you can fit almost any problem into a Hadoop uh, environment if you want to. Whether it's the best choice uh, is another question. Now the reason you would go for Hadoop in general is that it is the cheapest you know, uh, gigabyte per dollar option we have right now by far. You know, it's something like an order, like two orders of magnitude cheaper than typical data warehouses, for example. But on the other hand, it's less mature. The SQL is not nearly as good. It's not as fast in some respects. So if you really do have like a, you know, a problem that's a few terabytes, then and that's all you've got, then I don't think you'd be that well served by to do. But if you really are getting the point of many, many terabytes of data. And you also want to democratize your data, like make it possible for a lot of people to experiment with it and not just have this sort of select few you know, high priests that have access to the data. So that's another real advantage of Hadoop. And the, and the last thing I'll mention about what Hadoop is really great at is it really is a great data uh, integration platform. So if you really are pulling log data in that's very rough, you're pulling in you know, Twitter traffic to get sentiment, You've got your like transactions from purchases on the website, and you want to figure out like you know what problems did people encounter trying to operate the website? Did people start tweeting about this product that suddenly spiked in our sales? That's the kind of stuff where Hadoop is fantastic at, at helping you uh, integrate that kind of stuff. And, and one last question. Yeah. I'll get off the podium here. Uh, we're looking at other. Uh, platforms, and it's reaffirming that Hadoop is the best choice for what we're trying to do. Uh, we've also realized something that the term is the, the evidence mismatch of our relational models, the inherent uh, schisms and skewing that, are, that have occurred in there for years are freed up in the big data world. Uh, the question I have is, we're looking at schema on demand. And where does that fit into a Hadoop strategy? I'm not sure exactly I know what you mean by schema on demand. Where we allow the end users to decide what the names of the columns are, because in a relational model, uh, what is a customer? Well, that changes from department yeah, to department. Yeah, right. The column's name changes. I mean, that's what, that's what yeah. that whole mess was about. Yeah. Whereas if it's schema on demand, you give big data to your end user, you have them tell, decide what the name of it is, yep. and then you also have them select the schema yep. at, at, at runtime. Now, does that fit into a, a Hadoop 
yeah. philosophy? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a specific example of that. Um, <coughs> let me see if I can find a slide quickly. That, uh, make and that's sense. exactly what our company needs right now. Uh, so when I did the SQL example, this is, no, here it is. It might help if I present it again. So at the top here, I said create table and then load the data from this path in HDFS. Well, another way you can do hide is don't load it. Just say, I know the data is over here. Right. Just point to it. Right. Uh, so you can do two things as far as like giving people the ability to find their own schemas. You can right. have as many tables as you want pointing to that same data. Right. Uh, you can say that, well, if the data is like, say, it's column separated values, obviously I can't decide just on a whim that the third column is the person's age. I mean, I have, there's some restrictions, but I can use different names. Yeah. The other thing is, because storage is cheap, it's not uncommon for people to take like, you know, some big canonical data set and extract what they want out of it exactly. and just create copies. Even though that's slightly wasteful, no, you no. can do that too. But it might make your queries faster down the road, so that's the other thing. And you can certainly parse the data in different ways too. Yep. Or there is a lot of uh, support for this in Hive. What's the name of this thing? Metadata. External yeah. tables. No, no, no. Metadata manager. That's yeah, there's a there's something called the H catalog. That's right. sort of this. So uh, the other thing you can do with Hive, I can define the table in Hive. Then I can write in Paula queries. I can now talk, have pig read that metadata from the same <coughs> store. But so you've got those kinds of. Catalog allows you to overlay different. Right. So you can do you can do tricks like that. Very so it, it's helpful. it's another way in which it's really nice and flexible, it, which means you can shoot yourself in the foot more easily. But uh, in general, uh, we'll, we'll it's, take it's that easy. Risk. Yeah. Yeah. Boys. Yeah. I apologize. I don't think that you're full of it. <laughs> <laughs> I just. I mean, the problem is. The truth is always somewhere in the middle. If functional people are saying it's here, or, or people saying that it's here, it's somewhat gray area. If there are certain advantages in the functional languages, there are certain advantages in or in dismissing one out of the gate is a little bit painful. Right. So th this is well. I think the examples speak for themselves of how concise the functional versions are compared to the child uh, versions. No doubt about this. On another hand, if I am doing uh, my previous APIs, I can customize, I can optimize, which is taking away from me, for example, if I'm using cascading. Yes. Yeah. I'm stuck with the syntax. Right. And we did a couple of interesting experiments from this one. He was writing code in PA. The code was small. Yeah. The execution was slower. Yeah. By far. Yeah. So Pig is, yeah, that's one thing about Pig. It does, some of the things it does, it does really well and it's really fast. Where Scalding is, actually Cascading is quite good as far as performance. But don't make those trade-offs. Right, Maybe but the point is, I, I, I'm trying to say, don't look in one direction. Yeah. in all directions and then decide which paradigm fits you better. Because sure. if you try to do quick prototyping, no doubt, use Skype. Don't even yeah. bother. Yeah. If you try to build commercial strength application that is working at Hadoop, I don't know whether I want developers to use Skype. Well, I don't know. I think Hive is pretty safe, personally. Well, again. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it comes down to an ops, DevOps issue. It comes down to DevOps issue, it comes up to the performance, it comes up to the execution time. There is a lot of variables that you have to consider. Yep. If you're experimenting with data, use whatever is easier for you to write the code. Yeah. So <coughs> force is coming from using to do for extreme engineering, and pushing into those limits to do a lot of things that most people will never want to try to do. We're looking at it from what most commercial, like I've got a room full of SaaS programmers who are doing queries to get value out of the data. So the two different extremes as to the market focus, which has to happen. So for yeah. well, people. I agree. On another hand, uh, trying to market Hadoop is a very, 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 very large data place. I'm going to crap out of it. Yeah, the, that's a mistake a lot of people make. If I, Although people do replace data warehouses with Hadoop, they really have to know what they're doing. All right, I'll be around if anybody else has questions. Uh, thanks for coming. Thank